Okay, this is the third in my flip learning series about radiation, and this video is going to tackle spec point 7.6, 7.9, and 7.10. So essentially what we're looking at here is the radioactivity required practical, which is what this means. Okay, that's actually looks like one little learning objective, but there's quite a lot to unpick there. We need to know the names of the equipment and we also need to understand sources of background radiation. The reason that I have put source of background radiation in with the practical is because you need to be able to explain how to account for background radiation in that practical. I've also put here a little bit about the dangers of radiation because you need to be able to talk about the health and safety considerations for that practical as well. Okay, so in terms of the dangers of ionising radiation, um, if we've said that in, in um, video two that when alpha, beta or gamma ionize atoms what they do is change an atom that has got no charge into an ion which has got a charge and what these means is the chemical reactions between the atoms in organic tissues behave a little bit differently. The biggest problem is that the ionizing radiation can cause the DNA to mutate what that means is when the DNA is trying to copy, you've probably done in biology that the DNA makes to make, needs to make an exact replication of itself, all it means is there's an error in the copying of the DNA. Sometimes those errors have got no consequences whatsoever, but sometimes they can cause the cells to grow abnormally and sometimes that abnormal cell growth can lead to cancer. So if you have a look at the wording on this line here, I've got can, can, can. It's very important that you don't say does, because ionising radiation does not always lead to mutations. It does not always lead to cancer. So your wording in this little bit is quite important. So, as I've said, being exposed to ionising radiation does not always cause cancer. So one of the things that we need to get across is the likelihood of having a problem is linked to the dose of radiation that's received. So the other thing to bear in mind is ionising radiation is more dangerous if your cells are dividing at a high rate. So if you are old like me, it's not something you have to worry about. But if you are young like you guys, or if somebody is pregnant, or in terms of your reproductive cells, that is something that you need to take into consideration. Um, so, in terms of background radiation and where it comes from, first of all, back, there is background radiation around us all the time. Wherever you are sitting watching this video, there will be background radiation in the room that you are in. If I asked you to think of the main causes of background radiation, there's a big misconception that it's mainly to do with power stations, mainly to do with nuclear weapons. That misconception is kind of caused by the media and a bit of science fiction. So let's look at what's actually going on. I've got a pie chart here of the main types of radiation. Let's see if you can think about what goes where on that. In particular, I'm interested in what's this big chunk, half of the radiation around us, where is that from? So let's go through these. That biggest half here is something that is called radon gas, radon gas. Then we've got um, medical sources, under the ground, food and drink, cosmic, and then nuclear weapons, only a fraction of a percentage air travel a fraction of a percentage and nuclear reactors a fraction of a percentage so actually these two that are the ones most people think of not even one percent between them the other thing to think about is which ones are natural versus which ones are synthetic radon gas under the earth is, nat is natural the ones under the ground are natural in food and drink it's natural from cosmic rays you can't see the s or Apologies, I meant to put N's for natural rather than S's for synthetic. Let me just backtrack. So natural, natural, and then cosmic rays are natural. The ones that are synthetic are the others. So medical, nuclear weapons, air travel, nuclear reactors. But that's making up less than 15%. Okay, so natural is making up about 85% of the background radiation that's around us. 
what is radon gas then? So ra radon um, gas is one of the daughter products um, after uranium that's naturally present in rocks decays. Because it's from rocks, the rock structure varies under different parts of our country and you can see that over here in London we're quite lucky that we live in an area that's got quite a low radon gas level but the biggest problem areas are down here in Devon and Cornwall and actually when they design their houses a lot of the times they don't build them straight onto the ground instead they are lifted up and they've got quite a big foundation with fans underneath to blow that radon gas out so that it doesn't creep up through the floors. If you're interested in different doses for different things, this is a great um, kind of dose chart that shows you the smallest kind of doses of background radiation, for example, for things like eating bananas, all the way up to fatal doses such as 10 minutes next to the Chernobyl reactor. So that was xkcd.com forward slash radiation. OK, so what we need to know then, now that we've talked a bit about dangers and a bit about background, is about this experiment. So as part of that experiment, you need to be able to explain the equipment you use, health and safety considerations, how to account for background and interpreting results. So first of all, we need to think a little bit about the units. So the activity is the rate at which the source decays. Activity is measured in becquerels, which means decays per minute. Count rate is very similar, but it's a little bit different because it's all, sorry, decays per second for the becquerel count rate is very very similar but it's not what's actually being given out by the source it's what's being picked up by our detector okay so activity is counts per second of the source or decays per second of the source and count rate is decays per second by the detector so the proper name for the detector which looks like this looks like a little black tube um, is called a Geiger Muller tube. That on its own just uh, picks up the radiation but it has to be plugged into some kind of counter and what that will do is make usually make a little beep or a little tick each time it picks up a type of radiation. The Geiger Muller tube cannot tell on its own whether it has detected alpha, beta or gamma radiation so we've got to do a little bit of deduction to work out what type of radiation the source itself was actually giving off. So the next thing we're going to talk a little bit about is the random nature of decay. The fact that the unstable atoms or nuclei, I'm going to change that to nuclei would be better, um, decay at random means they're kind of linked to probability. What that means is, for this experiment, when you're explaining the method, it's super important that you tell uh, the person to do repeats. So, for example, if we compare to a, a flip of a coin, on average, every other one would be heads, every other, other one would be tails. So if you ask me how many times would I have to flick a coin to get four heads, probably eight. So we're going to have to do repeats here to get the expected result. So. What we want to be able to do is get the count rate from the source that we are looking at. But the total radiation reading that's picked up by the Geiger-Muller tube and the counter that we've just shown on the previous slide, that's going to include two bits, the background radiation and the radiation from the source. So what we need to do first is explain that you need to get a reading for the background radiation and then once you've got your total reading you have to subtract that to get the radiation that's actually from the source which is what we are interested in. So the radiation from the source is going to be the total reading minus the mean background reading. So when it comes to taking the background reading, you don't even take the source out of the box. 
all you do is you have your detector, you have your Geiger Muller tube and you just turn it on and you will start to hear those little clicks or ticks that I've decided. So what you would do is pick a time period. Let's say our time period is going to be one minute. All we would do is leave the Geiger Muller tube on for one minute and see what reading it shows at the end. Let's imagine it gives me 10. Then reset it, do the same thing again. The source isn't even in the room. Turn it on, watch the count. Let's say we get eight. Then we do it again. What do we get? Let's say 12, giving us a background count rate of 10, 10 um, decays or 10 counts per minute. So what we would then have to do is once we've taken, once we get the source out and take the readings, we're going to need to take away 10 to get the amount that's just from the source itself. The next thing we're going to look at is health and safety. And really this picture unpicks most of the health and safety that we need. OK, so we know that the danger here is going to be exposing humans to ionizing radiation and risking mutating their cells. So if you look at the picture here, what's going on? First thing is the person doing the experiment is wearing gloves. OK, so they've put some small shielding between themselves and the radioactive source. The second thing is they are using tongs to increase the distance between the source and their hand. The third thing is this here is the source. It's that's just a handle at the back. In fact, let me just rub that out so that you can see that's a handle at the back. So the sources are directional. This source is pointing downwards at the moment, but it's come from this a lead lined box. So we keep the sources in the lead lined box and we get them out of the box for the absolute minimum time we can. So you only get them out to quickly do the experiment, then they go straight back in there and into a locked cupboard. And the reason for that is to minimise the exposure. So we've said that the amount of exposure time links to the dose and the dose is going to link to the probability of causing a mutation. I mentioned that the source is directional, so when I'm doing this in class I have to take great care that I don't point this source at anybody, especially myself, but in particular nobody's eyes, because your eyes are basically holes in your face, so you're a bit vulnerable there, and especially anybody's reproductive organs. And the final thing that you might wish to do if you were going to work with radioactive sources all the time is wear a dose meter or dosimeter. The other thing to mention here is no under 16s are allowed to do this experiment because you, the rate at which your cells are dividing is quite high. Even under um, 18, sick formers um, have to be very, very strictly supervised if they do this experiment. So what would the results actually show you then? To understand this, we've got to link back to what we did in video two, which is the range in air and what stops each substance. So we know that the range of air of alpha, in fact, you might want to pause the video and see if you can remember this by heart before we get started. I'll carry on, is three to four centimeters and it's stopped by skin or paper. We know that the range of beta is a meter and it is stopped by a few millimeters of aluminium and we know that the range for gamma is infinite and it's either a few centimetres of lead or a few metres of concrete. So when it comes to doing this experiment there's a couple of things that you can do. You can either keep your Geiger Muller tube, if that's the end of the tube here going off to your counter, you can either keep your source right here and put different things in between the source and the Geiger Muller tube when they're really close together, or you can move the source this way so that there's different amounts of air between the source and the Geiger Muller tube and use that as an indicator. So with alpha then, or if we m move the source five centimeters, so more than this range away from the Geiger Muller tube and we notice a big drop in the count rate, that must mean it's an alpha source. The other thing that could tell us it was an alpha source is if we kept the Geiger Muller tube really close to the source 
but just putting a piece of paper made the count rate drop. In terms of tests for beta then, you might think the next sensible thing is to try and move the source a metre away from the um, Geiger Muller tube. But in practice, because it's quite directional, that just doesn't work, okay? So we can't do that. What you have to do for tests for beta is keep the source and the Geiger Miller tube close and you add different thicknesses of aluminium so the ones we've got in class go from about half a millimetre of aluminium maybe a 0.2 millimetre of aluminium up to about five millimetres of aluminium. If you're putting aluminium in and it doesn't change the count rate at all chances are you haven't got beta the chances are you've got gamma okay so if you want to stop gamma we know you've either got a few meters of concrete well we can't fit that in the lab or a few centimeters of lead so again we've got different thicknesses of lead that we put in between the source and the Geiger Muller tube and if that causes a drop you've probably got gamma so let's just have a look at the final slide here I've got a um, a little animation of this working in practice for you where's my mouse gone I just need to go off pen mode I think so um, if I have alpha, what would I notice is if I put paper, the paper would stop the alpha. If I move that back and I put aluminium foil, that's also going to stop alpha. Ooh, it's not letting me change. But if I change it to beta, it is stopped, but gamma can still go through. Ooh, I just forgot to turn my count rate on. If I put thin lead in there instead. Gamma can still get through that but beta would get stopped and alpha would get stopped. If I put thick lead alpha would get stopped, beta would get stopped and gamma some of it would get stopped. So there's a little count right there but not much. Okay so that's pretty much it for um, this practical. Um, let me just go back to the learning intentions. Ooh, all the way back to the learning intentions. Which were, explain the practical, which mainly focuses on how to account for the background rate, the fact that because radiation is random, you need to do repeats, and the health and safety. Knowing that the piece of equipment is called a Geiger Muller tube, and explaining for the the main sources of background from Earth, which is radon gas, and space, which is cosmic rays. Okay, that is it for this video.